You are listening to ESL Talk, a podcast made for English teachers by English teachers. Here are your hosts, Daniel and Golnaz. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fifth episode of ESL Talk. As we talked about cultural issues in the last episode, today we want to dive a bit deeper into the whole native and non-native speaker controversy. And as our guest this week, we have Chris with us. Yes, we do. Chris is an experienced English teacher with over 10 years of experience teaching not only in native settings like Canada, but also non-native settings like her homeland of China. So it's going to be really interesting to get her thoughts and perspectives teaching students from both sides. Yeah, and I'm really interested to hear about her perspectives and her experiences of teaching in both settings. Let's kick off today's discussion by looking at this somewhat charged topic, natives versus non-natives. So why has this topic become such an issue within the English teaching and ESL community, Golnaz? Well, these days, um, people from all around the world, because English is the number one language in the whole world, many people are learning it, many people are interested in learning it, and of course, many people naturally become... Um, you know, uh, good speakers of English uh, as their second language. So they become enthusiastic about sharing this with others and teaching it. This is something like what happened to me, actually, myself. So I can uh, think that it is really natural and it is really, um, you know, uh, normal for people all around the world to want to teach English although it is not their mother tongue and it is not their first language. Also, because of the, you know, the globalized society and lots of non-traditional settings today, online or, I don't know, global universities, campuses, lots of immigration all around the world, it has uh, brought everyone together. Uh, we have this huge community of native teachers and non-native teachers who are working today, but... Well, you know, uh, th th there seems to be a kind of a bias here. You know, is there a bias, Daniel? What do you think? I would probably say yes. Um, it depends on who the audience is. Um, from students' perspectives, depending on where students are, there probably is a bias uh, that goes towards more native teachers. Um, and probably that's an incorrect bias to have. Um, I think both sides, both crowds, native and non-native teachers, bring their own skills and experiences to the table. And just as I've met lots of native speakers who are extremely talented and brilliant at what they do, I've met some that aren't so brilliant and talented at what they do. And it's the same for non-native speakers as well. I think definitely schools, universities, um, educational companies need to look at the individual instead of the passport because that only tells a very, very small um, fraction of the story. And I definitely see among students that there is this, um, you know, kind of, preference for native speakers over non-native speakers and it can be a little bit uncomfortable if you're a non-native speaker and it can also cause some issues because you might be more qualified you might be more experienced you might have more understanding of, of certain topics than native speakers um, but that could still work against you just because you happen to have been born in this country or you have a passport for this country so i guess as a non-native speaker and a non-native teacher golnes um what's your experience with this how have you kind of you know um felt and what kind of things have you been through as a non-native teacher and a non-native student well i have not had that much experience working in different countries yet as a teacher but um the experience that i had in First of all, in Iran was, um, well, I didn't have any issues there because um, we do not have that much of an opportunity to be able to work with native teachers, which is something that is a big, um, you know, um, pity uh, that we, we do not, we cannot provide enough opportunities for native teachers to want to come to our country and teach in our country, uh, which I think would be a big opportunity for our learners. Um, so... I, I was never, um, you know, uh, judged or I never had any problems with this uh, in Iran. But in Turkey, um, the school that I worked with was a, um, perfectly uh, mature and uh, had a balanced, um, um, let's say, approach to this. I never felt anything negative towards this matter. 
uh, where I worked, but um, at many different job interviews, I unfortunately heard some things like, I mean, the whole job interview went really well, but like I was told that because I am a non-native, I am not going to get as much privilege as a native teacher would get. Like um, my pay would be less, my working hours would be longer. And they were like, okay, we are sorry, but you're not a native. So I was like, okay, you know, you're saying it like this is a, I mean, like cancer or <laughs> some kind of, you know, a problem that I have. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, yeah, you have to focus on the quality that I can or cannot bring to the table, you know, not, not, not where I am from. I, I do believe that we as non-natives have a, let's say, uh, we have more responsibilities compared to mm-hmm. native teachers. Um, we are responsible for our language development. We are uh, responsible for our professional development. We can never, ever um, say that, okay, because I am a teacher, I know everything. I know English perfectly. It, it is. It, it can never be true. So, yeah, my experience pretty much has been uh, good and bad. <laughs> what about you, Daniel? Have you uh, seen this from your side as a native speaker? Have you, you know, um, what have you seen from your side? Yeah, um, it's very interesting what you say, and it's you know, it's it's a little bit sad to hear that still those attitudes exist. Um, and and like you said, and like we mentioned earlier, it should kind of be focused on the individual and their skills and talents and abilities. Um, I would definitely say that I have experienced that before. Uh, many very well qualified teachers, because their face doesn't fit or their passport isn't the correct from the correct country, then that means their opportunities are severely limited in terms of pay, in terms of where they can teach, in terms of what they can teach. So I definitely would agree with you um, on that. And you know, a lot of countries where you know teachers go to to teach, maybe the Middle East, maybe Asia, they will specify in the job ad that they must be a native, a native speaker which means they must have a passport from the US or Canada or the UK or Australia or uh, New Zealand or South Africa. But even now, there's some discrimination um, with teachers from South Africa even being discriminated against because, you know, is, is are they native speakers? I would say yes, but many other um, governments and educational bodies decide that that isn't the case. So I definitely have seen this. Um, and again, you know, like we mentioned earlier, the fabric of communities is changing in certain countries like the us like canada like the uk the workforce is much more diverse than it was 30 or 40 years ago people are coming from different countries people are moving between those countries and this whole concept or this whole notion of nativeness versus non-nativeness it isn't really black and white anymore it isn't really clear so i would say that there is still a lot of barriers that we have to overcome with this issue. Um, but hopefully it is getting better from what I've seen. Although as a native teacher, who's had many opportunities because of where I happen to be from, of course, I've got the experience and the qualifications as well. Um, that makes it a little bit easier for me. So I can only imagine the struggles that, that you guys are going through. And, and if you're listening and you've had, you know, rejections or you haven't been asked for interviews or you've, you know, been told, well, you'll get paid less than, you know, we'd like to hear from you because, Um, it's definitely something that needs to change. And only by discussing it and talking about it can we start to overcome this. So as a native teacher, obviously I have my responsibilities and skills and not all native teachers, you know, train themselves. They just assume I'm a native speaker. I can teach English. And because of this attitude, it can cause a lot of problems, um, especially for students, because they're the ones that are on the receiving end in the classroom or the ones that are paying for lessons. So, as non-native ESL teachers, what are some of the differences and responsibilities and skill sets that you might have, Colnas? Um, as I said earlier, uh, the language development thing for me, for my, uh, I mean, for me, is really, really important. I think it is our, uh, it should be our priority number one, which usually I have seen that is not like. Um, I have seen, I have worked with a lot of great people who unfortunately uh, kind of, you know, turn blind to the fact that uh, English is not our first language. And even mm-hmm. if it was, even if it was our first language, we still would be um, in charge of our 
um, language development as a teacher, because we are a teacher, we have we have this responsibility to keep up to date, and also to practice English. I mean, it might seem um, a little bit, you know, too much for some people. They might not like this idea, but I always have felt that um, I need to work on my own English uh, skills um, as a teacher and like to advance them all the time. I still don't feel that I am where I should be, you know. I still feel that there is a long way to go and I still feel that there is a lot more to learn. Another responsibility that we have as non-native teachers, I think, is um, to never ever misteach our learners. I have had this experience with my students that sometimes they ask me some questions about um, different things about grammar, um, I don't know, about something, some pronunciation, different things. Um, sometimes I didn't know the exact answer. And I was like, I never told them, yeah, that's that's correct. What you're asking, yeah, that, that is what you, I mean, what you think is true. Go with it, no mm-hmm. problem. I never I never could do that because um, that would be misteaching and mislearning. And I, I mean, um, it's it's just not ethical. So I think that, it is, we have to be, you know, make peace with this, that I do not know everything. And if my students ask me a uh, question that I don't know the answer to, I can just tell them, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer, but I will look it up. I will um, search about it and I will let you know if I find anything. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I think these two, uh, as, as well as professional development, are big responsibilities that we always have. Yeah, I think it's the same for native teachers as well. There shouldn't really be a difference. If you're a professional and you do this as your as your job, then you should always be looking to improve, to train, to get better and to know more about that industry, about that area. Um, and even as a native teacher, sometimes I, I've had students ask me questions about complex grammar or conjugation or structure or certain expressions. And what does this mean exactly? Where did this come from? You know, why is this sentence constructed this way and not this way? And Sometimes, you know, because I'm just through osmosis, I've picked all this up when I was young. It's only once I do the courses and I do the certifications and the, you know, the master's degrees that I begin to really understand how everything does come together. So I don't think there's any issue with that. And I think I would be forgiven a lot more maybe than some non-native teachers, which isn't fair and isn't, you know, um, the right thing to do. But again, I think it does afford us a little bit of flexibility, which maybe non-native teachers might not get. So this kind of ties into the next question of job discrimination. And you've touched on this a little bit. Um, Would you feel that native and non-native teachers are treated differently? You know, when they apply for jobs, do you think some of your old colleagues maybe had different attitudes or maybe even some arrogance? Well, if we, I mean, based on, not my, based on my personal experience, but based on the experience that I have, you know, I have seen different advertise, job advertisements, I have read and I have heard about um, different stories. What I can see uh, universally is that, yes, Native teachers always have the privilege and they always come first and they are always a priority for most schools and for most, um, um, you know, Uh, educational groups. I do not agree with this, but I can understand why this is happening. And sometimes I feel that um, they do qualify better than non-native teachers, but it is not always true. I mean, it's not, we can never, ever generalize. And um, from my personal experience, I had the experience with working with um, native teachers and non-native teachers. Um, It was a great experience. I mean, I learned a lot from uh, my American colleagues and also from my other colleagues from other countries. Um, I could see, I mean, the uh, like the experience, the personal experience that I had was we had a kind of group that uh, we never agreed on everything. We never had the same style of working or same style of teaching, but we always had things to, you know, share and learn teach and learn from each other. So um, I think um, even if we are treated uh, unfairly sometimes from some groups or some people, uh, we still can, as teachers, we still have that power to um, make the change, you know. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I think this all ties in really well. It's it's about the having the right mindset as a teacher, being open, being honest. And it shouldn't really matter where you're from. But I think the pressure that you mentioned usually comes from institutions, private schools or private language schools or companies. They want to portray that image and they want to sell that image to their students who are their customers, which is money. So I can definitely understand why that attitude exists in a lot of places. Um, so just a final thought then before we bring Chris in to, for her to talk about her experiences, what approach should we have towards this issue then as, as colleagues, as schools, institutes, managers, um, I guess as, as colleagues, what approach should we have this native, non-native? Should there be a rivalry? Should there be any differences in the way things are done? I think as a non-native, uh, this is my recommendation for all non-natives, never feel less never feel, um, you know, smaller because, uh, yes, there is something going on in the world, but uh, it's not always true. It doesn't mean that every uh, native speaker that you meet is going to, you know, like judge you or, for example, um, mistreat you. Um, if you are open, if you are welcoming, and if you are kind of, you know, um, if you're confident enough in your own potential, uh, people will see that potential and people will uh, communicate with you through that potential. So uh, you should not really feel less of anything. But uh, as native teachers, I want to ask you, Daniel, what should the native yes. speaker's perspective be? I think as natives, you shouldn't focus on, oh, this person happens to be from this country, which is not an English speaking country. The attitude should be, well, wow, look at all this experience they have. They've taught in these countries or they've worked with these students or they have this unique experience that I can learn from. And I think native teachers should try to, you know, get as much information as they can. Learn from non-natives. You know, you have different approaches. We have different approaches. Everyone's different. So what can I learn? What can I develop? What can I improve? And again, focus on experiences and skills and qualifications, not just the passport because, these days with technology, with the globalized society that we live in, with, you know, education, you know, everything's so different. So ask those questions, have an open mind and try to learn from each other instead of having these negative stereotypes. Um, they may have had some truth in the past. I'm not even saying that they did, but they may have to some small extent. So we need to move away from that. And I think having an open mind and having, um, you know, kind of a, uh, a positive attitude towards your colleagues, no matter where they're from, or towards your students as well, can definitely be more rewarding than just being closed and just having these preconceived notions. So, yeah, I think this is just the start of our conversation. So we're going to bring Chris in in a moment, who's going to share her experiences. And we're going to move on to the next part of the podcast. Thank you. Okay, everyone, now let's listen to Daniel interview our guest, Chris, about this interesting topic. So welcome, Chris. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Daniel. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. Um, so if you could just start, Chris, just for our listeners, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe your background and your experience in English teaching? Sure. Um, I'm Chinese. I moved to Vancouver in 2012 to pursue my graduate studies in teaching English as an additional language. I've done my CELTA and DELTA certifications. Um, I have been an English teacher since, yeah, since I came to Vancouver, actually. Well, I used to teach English back in Shanghai, China, when I was teaching in an international school. Uh, but that was... Uh, just a year of experience. On the side, I also teach uh, Chinese as a second language. That's amazing to have both of those languages that you're able to teach so fluently and so expertly. And again, this is going to tie in really nicely to our um, discussion on qualifications and experience as well. So mm -hmm. what are some of the differences that you've noticed between teaching in China and then, you know, working and teaching in English speaking countries like Canada? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Well, like I said, 
uh, when I was in China, I only taught uh, in an international school. So my experience wasn't the conventional way of teaching that most people know as teaching in China. But I would say, as far as I know, there are more and more international uh, schools uh, being established in China. So if there are people who want to um, explore a teaching career in China, that's a way to go. Uh, based on my interactions, I would say interactions with um, parents or friends of mine who have become parents, there's this expectation for teachers of the English language. That is parents of, well, I would say the biggest demography for learning English as a second language in China are kids, right? So parents mm-hmm. have expectation for English English teachers that they are mostly, it's closely tied to the ethnicity of teachers, I would say. Uh, They would prefer native speakers who are white and also mainly from, let's say, the US, the UK and Canada, where people consider their accent as being very standard. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. It is really interesting because we've been discussing this a lot during today's discussion, the first part of the podcast. And I think this is something that's really evident. And it's not just China, it's other countries as well, where there seems to be this preference or this, you know, direction towards going for this as more of an image thing and a status thing more than the actual skills and abilities of the teacher. So let's move it on to now and being in Canada. What are some of the issues you face teaching English as a non-native teacher? Oh, where do I even start? (laughs) I think there are some internal and external challenges uh, for me personally. In terms of the internal challenges I've experienced is definitely, first of all, uh, lack of confidence to teach a language that is not my first language. Uh, reflecting on my career, I've definitely had uh, times when I actually shied away from teaching a certain courses. For example, when I first started teaching general English in a language school in Vancouver, I would prefer to teach the lower levels than uh, to teach higher levels, like the advanced levels. Or I also wasn't really confident in teaching elective courses such as pronunciation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can can understand that. Was that due to your own kind of confidence or was it because of others around you and and what you observed from native teachers? Well, it's definitely both, right? That's why I said there's the internal challenge that I wasn't Mm -hmm. confident in myself and I didn't have the... Mm, direct schooling or experience of myself as a learner taking those specific classes. Just like I mentioned before, uh, I'm teaching a, a language that is not my mother tongue. So, right, everything doesn't just come instinctively. I really have to do my studies and prepare for what I have to teach. I'm not saying native teachers don't need to prepare, but I'm just saying for me, I have to prepare extra. You absolutely do. Yeah. I think maybe you feel like not that you're inadequate, but you feel like I have to bridge that gap. I have to work that a little bit harder. I have to do a little bit more Mm -hmm. because some, maybe some native teachers, I'm I'm not speaking for everyone, but some maybe feel like, well, because I'm a native teacher, I'm already at this level. So other people need to reach my level, which isn't the case, but I can a hundred percent understand how you might feel because I've been on the other side as well. Um, so just tying into this, we've actually discussed this a little bit before. Um, have you ever experienced any discrimination, uh, lack of opportunities? Were you treated differently because of your non-nativeness? Well, luckily, I haven't had any soul-crushing encounters yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's fortunate of me. But a few incidents where the label of non-native English speaking teachers was imposed on me, for example, in uh, the break room of the school I used to work in, mm-hmm. I was mistaken as a TESO trainee, even though I had been introduced as a TESO trainer. I, I trained, uh, I was a TESO trainer briefly for a year in the school. And one day there was this new colleague who I was introduced to and then he 
I could see how puzzled he was when he heard I was the trainer and then had to confirm again. Are, are you sure you're not a trainee? Like things like that. Wow. And what else? There was uh, another incident was I attended a job interview. It was a startup learning center owned mm -hmm. by a Chinese owner. And halfway through the, no, actually at the beginning of the interview, after I finished uh, introducing myself, she found out I was Chinese and then started shifting the language to Chinese and told me in Chinese that, well, non-native speakers don't know the language. I mean, the English language as well as the native speakers. So she would actually contact me if in the future she will have students who want to learn Chinese instead of hiring me as an English teacher. So. Oh. Yeah, that's oh, something. yeah, but I I think that is pretty soul destroying because <laughs> all your experience and qualifications and you know education that you've gone through it is just kind of being tossed aside and that doesn't tell the story at all. So I hope that these attitudes are starting to change and I hope that's not indicative of the whole industry. But it sounds like in a lot of places it still is. So tying into students, then have students ever commented on your non-nativeness while teaching them? Have they ever used it as a not a criticism, but have they ever pointed that out or kind of, you know, highlighted that when you're teaching? Not really, actually. In a way, I think at least most of the students I've taught, they're pretty uh, open-minded and I would say tolerating, right? They, as long as they get to know you as who you are, as a good teacher, right. they don't really um, care where you actually come from. Uh, but there were... There was one student I remember. She just casually said, I think we were discussing uh, either idioms or phrasal, uh, phrasal verbs. And then she made this comment saying, oh, okay, so I will double check. I will ask my Canadian friend. Wow. So I don't think she was aware of her comment at the moment. But as a non-native teacher, I did actually just, you know, read more into it it's mm -hmm. hard to ignore that comment in a way absolutely did you respond to it or did you just kind of keep it to yourself at that moment and i was just like uh, it's good that you actually have canadian friends to interact and then practice your language mm -hmm. with right and i try not to be affected too much because it could really take a toll on my own mental well-being <laughs> And even as a native speaker, I've had times when students have asked me things and they've doubted my answer. And that's good because we, you know, as students, they, we should be critical. And as, as teachers, we should always want to learn and we should always want to be, have an open mind and an open approach. So again, I guess the advice is not to take it too personally. I don't think the intentions are bad, but it's just to try to understand and try to challenge slowly, gently erode those stereotypes and those attitudes. So would you agree that actually non-natives have some advantages over native speakers? I have seen this and I would say yes, but do you agree? Well, I can say who has advantages over whom, right? I don't, mm -hmm. I really don't want to compare and also I don't want to be compared. Right. But I will say each group has their own um, advantages and disadvantages. As a non-native speaker myself, I do uh, think I have the advantage that I learn the language as a second language so I can relate to my students' experience in a more uh, direct way. Learned grammar very explicitly, so that really helped me with my uh, teaching. Besides that, for my um, graduate studies and also for immigration purpose, I have taken both IELTS and TOEFL. So the experience of taking those English proficiency tests really helped me with, uh, you know, teaching those skills to my students. I would definitely agree that having that empathy and going through that same experience of students, that definitely builds a better understanding of their needs and what they're going through and what they're experiencing. So I, that gives you a really unique outlook because, you know, a lot of the times, native speakers haven't really taken or well, not always taken the time to learn the language thoroughly. So when they're asked a question about a grammar rule or about a, you know, a certain phrase or a conjugation or sentence structure, they just know English through osmosis. So they don't necessarily have the right answers. Whereas some or many non-native uh, teachers who've gone through that process will be able to answer that better. So I definitely say that that's one distinct advantage. Um, so 
a lot of our listeners here are already English teachers or thinking about teaching English online or in the classroom. So what advice or what tips would you have for those non-native teachers who are starting out and thinking about becoming uh, English teachers? There are quite a few tips I would give uh, in terms of tips to new novice teachers. I would say uh, always take time. Um, planning and rehearsing even what you're going to teach because repetition does uh, make a difference. Uh, for or for teachers generally, I say I would say keep learning. For non-native teachers, we are always learning about the newest or the best methodologies, but at the same time, we're also learning the language itself, improving. Uh, your own language, and also get to know more about the cultural aspects involved in that language. So that's actually very key. One thing I found very difficult when I was teaching, oh well, during my first few years of teaching English was I found it really hard to be a representative of the language and also of the Canadian culture to mm -hmm. international students. Right, you really have to uh, be able to immerse yourself in that language and culture to be able to feel comfortable teaching your students who are learning that target language. Yeah, definitely. I think I think that's a really uh, good piece of advice to have. And and again, it all kind of links back to the message that we always always manage to get back to, which is have an open mind, be reflective, always you know be open to learning new things and. Uh, You know, taking on feedback and feedback is crucial, I think, from students and from your colleagues and from one another. So, Chris, thinking back to when you were learning English or when you're thinking about becoming an English teacher, what's the one thing that you would like to have known before? What's one thing where you think, oh, I wish I knew this or I wish I found this out before I started teaching English? Taking into consideration of the time that we're in now, especially under the influence of the pandemic, right? We're doing a lot of online teaching that does make us um, expand our range. We can teach remotely in a more convenient way. Uh, knowing that, I wish I had specialized in teaching younger learners. I actually mm -hmm. started teaching elementary school kids and then slowly shift to teaching adult. But since the beginning of the pandemic, I've noticed this trend, especially in China. There are a lot of um, young kids as early as the age of five or six. They actually have started taking online co courses yes. with teachers abroad. This is a massive, um, a massive market right now, and it's huge. And, you know, this is really great that we have you as a guest today, Chris, because... You know, a lot of new teachers have seen all of these advertisements, all these new companies and online teaching schools for Chinese students. So why are there so many students in China now who want to learn English, especially younger learners? Why is that? First of all, I think that's embedded in our so-called extracurriculum culture. It's <laughs> such, uh, a trend that kids are busy with all sorts of activities and courses outside of their school hours. I think that's the trend. That's the norm in Japan and Korea as well, based on what I've learned from my uh, students. So kids are always busy taking extra, either English classes, math classes, and now uh, the latest trend is even coding for yes. young learners. At the same time, I think the economy of China has really soared within the past 20, 30 years, right? So parents have the means to provide to their kids something that they didn't get to uh, experience. And the investment on education has always been the central factors in the Chinese culture. So one more question, Chris, before we uh, run out of time for today. What are the skills and qualities that many Chinese students look for in a good English teacher? And how can teachers attract Chinese students to learn with them and take advantage of this really huge market at the moment? Well, I remember when I was a student, the expectation, well, that was 10, 20 years ago, right? The expectation for a good English teacher was someone who can really explain the rules, the formulas, why we say the way we say it. But recently, uh, I think there's this, um, I would say, 
the reason behind the native speaker fever was more of the conversational goal of students, of the Chinese students especially, right? We used to have this thing among Chinese students. We called mute English, so students who can read and write very well, but they really struggled with listening and speaking. The cultural influence from the U.S., from Canada, there are more ex uh, exposures for students to be able to watch English movies or being influenced under the pop culture in English. So kids do want to be able to carry out at least dialogues or simple conversations with English speakers. Great advice. Yeah, I guess make it relevant and engaging, which is the key to any successful teaching mm -hmm. and especially English teaching. That's great. Um, we'll wrap it up there for today. Thank you so much for your time, Chris. Uh, really interesting getting your insights and your uh, tips and advice um, for new teachers as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening again today. If you have any questions or would like to share your stories with us, feel free to let us know so we can discuss them in future episodes. Our email address is esltalkpodcast at gmail.com. And also a big thank you to all of those who've actually reached out already. Uh, we're looking forward to answering your questions and having you as guests on our future episodes. Also remember to follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook, ESL Talk Podcast. Thank you, guys. Stay safe. Be well. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe for new episodes and to follow us on Instagram and Facebook for even more ESL teaching content.